Good morning. Welcome to History Comes Alive. We're returning to sunny Italy this week, uh, specifically the city of Venice. I'm sure many of you have been there on your travels around the world. Venice just opened up to tourism to a very small degree uh, just last week, I believe, uh, although there are some in Venice who would just as soon the tourists stay away a little bit longer. They're enjoying having the city for the most part to themselves uh, during this time of pandemic. So we're, we're fascinated by Venice. The idea of Venice has an image of splendor and romance in our minds. And in case you're wondering, that uh, curious scene of Venice there on the right, that's actually, if you can guess, uh, not Venice, but Las Vegas. It's a reconstruction of Venice at the Bellagio Resort in, in Venice, where just like uh, travelers of old would go to Venice to fulfill their wildest fantasies, I guess you can do that at the Bellagio as well and pretend you're in, you're in Venice. So this uh, romantic image of Venice is wonderfully captured in the Hollywood movie from 1955, Summertime, starring Catherine Hebern and Rossano Brazzi in the movie. And I want to play a, just an, one of the opening scenes or a couple of scenes strung together from Summertime. And you'll see there's a great atmosphere. It's a wonderful story, highly recommend it to you. And uh, involves, uh, in essence, a spinster played by Catherine Hebern finds romance on a trip to Venice. And the romance is not uh, fully fulfilled, uh, but I, I don't want to leave you with a spoiler, but has some wonderfully iconic scenes about Venice. So in this excerpt that you're going to see, it uh, runs maybe three or four minutes. So you'll see, uh, first of all, she's, want, she's just arrived in Venice and she's wandering through the narrow streets and alleyways, and you'll hear a an opera aria being sung from somewhere up in someone's balcony. Uh, she encounters a street urchin, very typical youth uh, roaming the streets of Venice. And he's, uh, of all things, he's selling dirty postcards, which of course she'll have nothing to do with. But it's a reminder that, uh, as I'll explain later, in Venice, everything is for sale. Everything is for sale, uh, regardless of uh, moral characteristics. Uh, also, the young lad whose name is Mauro, uh, at one point he looks at her and in a typically Italian gesture, he says, it's better at night as he points to his eye. So there's some uh, lurid proposals lurking behind that comment. Uh, then Catherine Hebron wanders on in the direction of the piazza, the plaza in front of uh, St. Mark's Basilica. And you'll see the lion on the facade of St. Mark's. You'll see the horses which I'll talk about shortly. And of course, you'll see the dumbfounded tourists, American tourists. One of them says poignantly to the guide, don't change a thing. So we'll see, and let me cue up now uh, a scene or two from the movie Summertime. Looking for a thing, lady? No. No. Not today. Tonight. Not today, not tonight. Tomorrow night. He's back at the night. Look, you be a good boy and run along home. Home? Oh, I got no home. You mean you've got no place to live? I live in a boat. Bosco, lady. <laughs> OK. You take this and get some food with it. Food with it. You see, some good nourishing food.
Piazza San Marco. Don't change a thing. Not one thing. No, madam. Indeed, the Venetians are not about to change anything because they derive a lot of tourist revenue from keeping things just the way they always have been in Venice. However, I should point out an excellent example of that. The Campanile, the bell tower at St. Mark's. Uh, there's the Las Vegas version. And there is one of the famous uh, Photoshop uh, scams purporting to show the collapse of the Campanile. It did, in fact, collapse, fell to the ground in 1902. It was said it fell like a gentleman, how appropriate for Venice, was rebuilt on the spot. The only casualty in this uh, calamity was the caretaker's cat was killed in the collapse. And it just goes to show Venice thrives on preservation, continuity, keeping the things the way they always were. The reality for Venice, and one of the reasons why Venetians are so obsessed with stability and preservation is they live a very precarious existence and have for over a thousand years. The city is barely above the water. So on the right is a modern map to orient you. Uh, it shows the uh, lagoon about seven by 35 miles in dimensions and in the lower center is that dolphin-shaped uh, collection of islands, originally 117 islands that have uh, coalesced, come together over the centuries. And uh, the map on the left from about 1500 shows what's just below the surface. Swamps, sandbars, mud flats. So you are literally, at any time in Venice, you're just a couple of feet above, well, disaster. And I should point out too, we often refer to the canals of Venice. The word in Italian is canali, which more appropriately means channels, because a canal, we'll be talking about a canal next week, uh, the Panama Canal, the big dig, um, and a canal typically is associated with a trench. Well, these are not trenches, they're just channels remaining after the land has been built up over the surface of the water. And in the summer, hottest months of the summer, in August, those channels become natural sewers, adding their uh, aromatic flavor to your experience in Venice if you are unfortunate enough to be there in August. Well, uh, Venice, as I say, is always uh, on the verge of disaster or actually flooding. Um, here's a scene from last November, the worst floods or the aqua alta, the high water in, in over 50 years struck Venice. Uh, this is a phenomenon especially prevalent in the 20th century, not because the ocean or the Adriatic is rising, but for the most part because the land is settling. The land has been settling since the late 19th century when artesian wells were dug to support development on the mainland, and as that water uh, is evacuated uh, from the subsurface strata, the, the land is actually sinking, even though those wells have been banned since the 1960s. There's still the influence of tides, uh, currents, and so on. And, and so Venice is still sinking at the rate of about one to two millimeters per year, if you're counting. Um, so what do you do about it? The Venetians have an idea. They had an idea introduced by the authorities in 2003. It's called the Mose Project in Italian. The name alludes to Moses parting the Red Sea, but in fact, it's an acronym as well for an Italian uh, designation, uh, Experimental Electromechanical Module. The idea here is that you would fix 78 hollow pontoons across three entrances into the lagoon, and if an unusually high tide is expected, they'd be inflated with air, they'd float up, and they would theoretically block the surge coming in from the Adriatic. The original cost was to be about one and a half billion dollars. 
Uh, like everything in Italy, the project ended up being riddled with inefficiency and corruption. And I say that as an Italian-American, so I know whereof I speak. Project still not finished. Um, it may be completed in 2022. Final cost estimates now $6 billion and rising. Viva Italia. Well, uh, what on earth led people to eke out a living in this precarious spot out in this lagoon in the Adriatic? Tribesmen on shore began to migrate into the lagoon in the 4th and 5th centuries AD. They found small humps of land where they could fish, uh, gather salt. They built small huts on poles, started to reclaim the land, fencing, draining, filling the land. Uh, by legend, the first settlement dates to March, very precisely, to March 25th, 421 AD, Annunciation Day, when a church was built by these early settlers. And this church, like virtually every other building in Venice, was built on oak poles, thousands of oak trees, essentially, uh, driven into the soft soil at the bottom of the lagoon. And over the centuries, these trees have become petrified. There you can see in a diagram. And so Venice today, for the most part, still sits on top of these old wooden poles. This reinforces the idea that Venice is in fact a very unnatural place to live. It's artificial, it's a human invention. And again, that's why the Venetians are so obsessed with continuity and stability. With being surrounded by water, penetrated by water really, and with no arable land out in the lagoon, Venice early on develops into a commercial powerhouse, an independent city-state, a city-state populated by traders, merchants, and Venice became a great maritime power in the Mid Middle Ages, late Middle Ages. The city operated a fleet of about 3,300 vessels at the peak in the 15th century, mostly uh, galleys with oars. About 36,000 sailors manned those galleys, uh, about a quarter of the population of Venice, included many slaves, convicts, sentenced to imprisonment on the galleys. And uh, you see here the royal barge of Venice, the Bucentoro, once a year to reinforce the need to propitiate the gods of the waters. Once a year, the ruler of Venice would sail out in his barge out beyond the Lido or the outer uh, barriers at the entrance to the Adriatic he would toss holy water and a ring into the water and thereby declare his marriage to the sea to keep her happy and to allow her to uh, maintain the city's prosperity through trade. One of the important merchants, of course, a Venetian, and I'll be talking about a lot of people who, interestingly enough, come from Venice. We don't necessarily associate them with the city of Venice, but uh, Marco Polo came from a noted merchant family, his father and uncle, took him in the 13th century on a journey to China along the Silk Road. While he was there, he stayed on for a few years, became a diplomat for Kublai Khan, the Mongol ruler of China and points west. And uh, later, after he returned to Venice, his travels were committed to paper, published, and inspired not only Christopher Columbus, who we know had a copy of Marco Polo's book, but inspired travelers all around the world. And if we can go back to that slide for just one second, I want to point out uh, the strange wonders that Marco Polo saw on his journey, including an elephant there. And uh, if you look at that, uh, the trunk of the elephant gives new meaning to the word uh, trunk. He looks sort of like he's trumpeting. So when an elephant trumpets, anyway, that's Marco Polo's, or the illustrator's conception of an elephant trumpeting. Maritime activities were so important to Venice that the city established as early as the 12th century an assembly line 
the first assembly line known to history, building ships. Up to 16,000 workers were employed in this facility called the Arsenal, the largest industrial enterprise in Europe, or in the world for that matter, before the Industrial Revolution. This system was so efficient that in 1574, the King of France came to Venice and while he was enjoying dinner, a ship was built while he waited. The Venetians always tried to make money, clearly a commercial motive, make money off the sea. And a particularly sad incident in history occurred in 1204. Crusaders en route to the Holy Land were diverted, hired by the pretender to the Byzantine throne in Constantinople. And on the way to the Holy Land, they stopped off in Venice, hired a fleet, proceeded to sail not to the Holy Land, but to Constantinople, where they looted, sacked the city. And you see on the right, the famous horses, originally in the Hippodrome, or the horse racing uh, stadium in Constantinople, taken back by the looters and set up uh, originally on the front of St. Mark's Basilica. The ones there now are replicas. The actual horses, the bronze horses, stolen by these renegade crusaders are in the attic. And uh, I know they're in the attic because I toured that uh, when my wife and I visited a few years ago. And of course it said on the signs, no photographs allowed, which never inhibited any uh, good Italian or Italian American from taking photographs. So that's where the real horses are. Another uh, unfortunate side effect of seaborne trade is you are susceptible to diseases being introduced into your territory on sailing vessels. And Venice was hard hit by the Black Death, that uh, pandemic of bubonic plague that struck all of Europe and really the entire world for the most part in the 14th century. In 1448, one of the subsequent outbreaks of the Black Death in Venice induced city officials to require uh, all incoming sailors to be isolated for a period of 40 days. And the word for 40 days in Italian is quaranta giorni, and that is the origin of the term quarantine, that 40-day period when sailors into Venice had to stay on board at the risk of uh, infecting the city with bubonic plague, carried on the fleas, on the rats, endemic in the holds of sailing ships. Well, by the 14th, 15th century, based primarily on commercial enterprise, Venice is a center of the world economy. There you have a painting dating from about 1500, showing the old Rialto Bridge in the background across the Grand Canal, and all sorts of uh, bustling activities in Venice. Venice was a very cosmopolitan city, very sophisticated, peopled with exiles, immigrants, had a population in 1500 uh, of around 180,000 people, which is three times the population today. And I wanna, want you to note here, if you can see on your screens, um, here is a, a gondolier, a black gondolier, undoubtedly a slave. Uh, blacks were uh, purchased on the open market like everything else in Venice, kept as sort of household pets, you might say. And here's a real pet. What would a scene from Venice be without a pet dog here in the gondola with a noble lady out uh, enjoying her travels through the city? Venetians were obsessed with making money. The German illustrator Dürer remarked in 1500, again, about the time of this uh, painting, Dürer referred to the Venetians as, quote, the most faithless, lying, thieving rascals 
such as I could scarcely believe could exist on earth. And yet, if one did not know them, one would think that they were the nicest men on earth. The Venetians, particularly in their uh, merchant activities, specialized in luxury goods, uh, very important in Europe, gold, silk, lace, soap, um, glass, still produced on some of the outlying islands around the city of Venice itself. Uh, glass making in particular was a state secret in Venice, so important to the economy that uh, two glass blowers fled the island of Murano where the glass making industry was based and the Venetian state ordered them to be tracked down and assassinated lest they give other competitors in Europe the secrets to making fine Venetian glass. Venetians had no particular interest in intellectual pursuits or classical learning, but they knew the commercial value of knowledge. We have the Venetians to thank for the first copyright law to protect investments made by printers as they published works after the invention of movable type. And also the first paperback books were invented in Venice. Important in the Venetian economy, as in economies throughout Europe, the Jewish communities. Merchants, artisans, money lenders in a predominantly Christian world. In 1516, the Viennese, or excuse me, the Venetian authorities took steps to segregate the Jewish community in Venice. They established an enclave, a walled district, shown here in an illustration. And the district was located near the cannon foundries for the Venetian state. And the Venetians gave this district the term ghetto. The word ghetto is taken from a dialect Venetian term for a metal casting. So the foundries gave their name to what became the first named ghetto in the city of, or in the, uh, in the uh, continent of Europe. You can see one of the two bridges there on the left closed off at night, forcing the Jewish families to stay in a kind of a quarantine overnight, lockdown. And this district is probably where Antonio is shown. There's an illustration from Shakespeare's play, a playbill, The Merchant of Venice. Where else would you find a merchant? There's Antonio on the left, and he's seeking a loan from Shylock, Jewish moneylender on the right. Again, that transaction in real life would have taken place in the Jewish ghetto in Venice. Venice, like Florence, called itself a republic, but in fact, Venice was an oligarchy ruled by 100 aristocratic families who monitored and controlled every aspect of public life. It was said in Venice, in private, you could do whatever you wanted, and people in fact did, but in public, tightly controlled. Uh, the figurehead, head of the Venetian state, was the doge. From the word duke, one of them is shown there on the right with his ceremonial headgear and cloak. A very uh, grave, stern figure, a symbol of this uh, continuity and stability and conservative public nature of the city of Venice. Over the course of a thousand plus years, uh, 120 men were appointed to serve in this position as the de facto ruler of Venice. Tyranny and oppression were the order of the day under the Venetian regime. Venice was really, for most of its history, what we would now call a police state. A dreaded council of ten served as secret police, judges, executioners. Justice was impartial but strict. A common method of execution was to strangle a prisoner in his cell and dump him into the lagoon. One 20-year period in the 1700s, 73,000 executions or lifetime sentences on the galleys were recorded in Venice. Network of spies and informers, 
penetrated Venice. There on the left is the Boca de Leon, the mouth of the lion. The lion was a symbol of the city of Venice. And if you had somebody to denounce, you would write their name and their crime, purported crime on a piece of paper, slip it into this slot in the Boca de Leon into the mouth. And as a consequence, there wasn't a lot of crime in Venice because everybody was watching everybody else. Venice is especially noted for its prisons. The Bridge of Sighs, shown there on the right, connected the, the ducal palace, the interrogation rooms within the palace, connected them to a prison. And the, I think this photograph showing the fog really reflects the atmosphere of secrecy and mystery that surrounded all matters of state in Venice. Newspapers, for example, could write gossip, they could write scandal, but they could not report on politics. In fact, the official archivist for the city of Venice was illiterate, which allowed him to maintain a suitable distance from official records of the shenanigans taking place within this uh, closed circle, this ruling circle in Venice. The wealth and power of Venice are reflected in its architectural heritage, particularly, of course, the magnificent St. Mark's Basilica. The basilica was built in the 11th century, although the facade, the Gothic facade, dates from the 14th century. You see on the left there the horses above the facade. Again, those are fakes, just like the campanile, the bell tower is fake. These horses are fakes, the original kept inside. And when you go inside the basilica, it's very striking. Uh, architectural features here. This is a pre-Gothic cathedral, so you don't have the soaring space, more of a, a heavy, a massive, grounded look, round arches, small windows, and especially the gilded mosaics, characteristic feature of the interior of St. Mark's. Behind the altar, which is not visible really in this photograph, behind the altar are the remains of the Apostle Mark, St. Mark. He, was, he had died in Alexandria in Egypt, and in the year 828, his remains were smuggled out of Alexandria by merchants, since Alexandria at this time was under Muslim control. They buried St. Mark's remains in a barrel of salted pork, shipped him across the Mediterranean, and ensconced him behind the altar of St. Mark's. Some claim that the flooding that continually strikes Venice was perhaps a punishment from God for stealing, or as the word is officially, translating the remains of St. Mark from his final resting place in Alexandria to his real final resting place behind the altar of St. Mark's. I want to play for you just a snippet of music. This is the kind of music that you might have heard in St. Mark's uh, back in the 16th century. Music by a composer by the name of uh, Giovanni Gabrielli, born in Venice. And if any of you had the privilege of playing a brass instrument in the high school band or college band, his music is a, uh, a staple of those uh, musical ensembles. He was the organist at St. Mark's, and a noted composer as well. And the music I'm going to play is from one of his, uh, just a very brief excerpt from one of his canzoni, or songs. These are designed for antiphonal instrumental choirs. So as you're looking at that, uh, the image on the slide, if we can go back to that image, uh, again, those uh, choir lofts, left and right, you would have small groups of instrumentalists and creating an early stereo effect, antiphonal effect. And again, this is a modern arrangement of a uh, short excerpt from a canzona of Giovanni Gabrielli. Just imagine this music being played in the sacred space of St. Mark's.
In the 17th and 18th century, after the time of Gabrielli, Venice underwent a period of military and political decline. Conspicuous consumption became especially prominent. Parties and pageants were held under state auspices to keep the people's minds off the declining economy, off the state-sponsored oppression. On the right is a painting of a state-financed casino that opened in 1638 to provide opportunities for gambling. Note the masks worn by the customers in this uh, casino. A culture of hedonism expressed itself in Venice. Venetian artists invented the female nude portrait. Imagine painting naked women lying down. A great example is the painting on the left by Titian. It's a part of a painting entitled Venus of Urbino, uh, very scandalous in its day and to some extent scandalous as well today. The model for this painting was probably a courtesan, a prostitute. The prostitutes of Venice were famous throughout Europe. Even nuns would take leave from their official duties and make some extra uh, ducats, some extra money on the side, practicing this most ancient art form. In the 17th century, an estimated 20% of the women in Venice were engaged in the sex trade. And it was taxed, great source of revenue for Venetian municipal coffers. Casanova himself, also a Venetian, Giacomo uh, Casanova, the 18th century sexual adventurer, he found much to his delight in the city of Venice. He said, I quote, the chief business of my life has always been to indulge my senses. I never knew anything of greater importance. So he was right in his element uh, in Venice. And uh, a more benign form of recreation, a fad for hot chocolate swept the city of Venice in the late 18th century. And there you have a painting showing a patrician woman lounging in her boudoir, accompanied by some male friends and a priest. They're all enjoying hot chocolate, maybe some gossip, discussing the latest scandals. But despite the declining fortunes of the Venetian state, enough money was retained in the economy to support the arts. Art, architecture, Venetians still had enough money to impress their fellow citizens, impress tourists like us today. We admire, for example, on the left, one of the gilded palaces along the Grand Canal. This particular palace built by a noble family in Venice in the 15th century. On the right is the Church of the Holy Redeemer, built by a Venetian architect, architect uh, Andrea Palladio, in 1576. Note the, the classical symmetry of the facade. He really uh, engendered a whole school, a whole style of architecture called Palladian, which uh, in fact inspired Jefferson when he built Monticello, just evoking that, those classical ideals of symmetry, balance, proportion. In the field of art, painting, here's Giovanni Bellini's Feast of the Gods. Bellini was a Venetian-born artist, painted this in 1514, and you can see how the Venetian school of artists loved color, vibrant color, expressive, mood-enhancing color, but not always the strongest in their underlying design of their paintings. In fact, Michelangelo himself, not a Venetian, Michelangelo uh, made a name for himself in Florence and later on in Rome. Michelangelo commented that he liked Titian, but he thought it was too bad that Venetians can't really draw. And their paintings are often uh, criticized as being uh, superficial, more to dazzle the eye than to convey any deep a spiritual or aesthetic meaning. 
It's not another painting uh, of interest, another great Venetian artist, Paolo Veronese. This is the wedding at Cana, depicting the event when Christ turned water into wine. And I introduce this painting because it also, we've heard Gabrielli, uh, a hint of music is in this painting as well. So it combines both art and music because you can see in the enlargement I've taken out from the uh, bottom center of the painting itself, you see Christ uh, literally playing second fiddle. He's in the background. Oh, he's got a halo on, but the real focus is on the guy in the front uh, playing the viola da gambo. That is none other than Veronese himself injected into the painting as a musician at this huge festive scene. To continue on the theme of music, two uh, noted musical figures from Venice. On the right is the only extant portrait of Antonio Vivaldi. He was a violin prodigy, brought up as a priest, but he declined to function in that role, uh, complaining of asthma. He was often referred to as the red priest. If you took off the wig there, you could see his red hair and fiery temperament. While working in Venice, Vivaldi got a job as the music master in an orphanage. Orphanages were very important in, in Venice. A lot of the illegitimate daughters of the Venetian nobility ended up in orphanages rather than the uh, typical method of infanticide in Venice was simply to throw them into the canals, unwanted children. So Vivaldi wrote a lot of music for the girls in this orphanage, most famously the Four Seasons, which is uh, a series of four violin concertos, uh, often played as one piece, based on four sonnets, sonnets about nature that Vivaldi probably wrote himself. And I'm going to play a short excerpt from the spring movement in the Four Seasons, and you'll hear, besides this delightful uh, late Baroque music, you'll hear an evocation of bird song in the instrumentation. So again, you'll recognize this from Vivaldi's Four Seasons. <laughs> Now, of course, there aren't a lot of birds on Venice, very little nature uh, in Venice. So Vivaldi undoubtedly was inspired more from time he spent on the mainland, which, uh, by the way, for much of Venice's history, uh, a portion of the mainland was included in the, quote, Republic of Venice. Now, uh, during the time of Vivaldi, opera was all the rage in Italy and Europe generally. The first public opera house opened in Venice in 1640. And Vivaldi, for a time, wrote operas, became an opera impresario, but he wasn't very good at it. And as opera falls out of fashion, Vivaldi moves to Vienna, where he dies a pauper. He's buried in an unmarked grave. And for those of you who love Vivaldi, you'll be shocked to learn that Vivaldi was virtually unknown until 1926, when all of his manuscripts were rediscovered in a monastery in Italy. Now, you're probably wondering about the character on the left there, Lorenzo da Ponte. Like Vivaldi, fascinating character. You could write a book about da Ponte. In fact, if any of you are interested, uh, you can Google the librettist of Venice, a very wonderful book about the life and times of Lorenzo da Ponte. He, like Vivaldi, was a priest, also had two children, um, never inhibited by his priestly collar, was a wild youth, a friend of Casanova, in fact, became a librettist, 
writing the words to accompany operas, he ended up in Vienna, where he collaborated with Mozart on Mozart's most uh, famous comic operas, then ended up in London, driven out by a series of uh, financial misfortunes, driven out again. He ended up in America, to Sunbury, no less, small town up the Susquehanna River, where his brother-in-law owned some land. And for a time, he became a pharmacist in Sunbury, Pennsylvania. Uh, eventually ended up in New York City, where he opened the first opera house in New York City, and became a naturalized citizen in 1828, at the ripe old age of 79, showing there are second, third, and fourth acts in anyone's life. Lorenzo da Ponte, a wonderful uh, countryman of mine. Well, late in the 18th century, Venice is on hard times. Its power base shrunken, no military alliances, to support itself, to sustain itself. And Napoleon, in his march across Europe, invades Venice in 1797, ending over a thousand years of independence by the Venetians. Napoleon promptly trades off Venice to Austria. Austria occupies Venice more or less through the middle of the 19th century, a mood of gloom and decay settle on Venice, the noble families die out, the old sources of wealth are dissipated. In 1816, an English writer wrote, I quote, Venice indeed appears to be at her last gasp, but Be Venice makes lemons out of lemonade, becomes a center for the grand tour of the idle rich. It becomes a picturesque romantic ruin, a refuge from the industrialization that begins to sweep across Europe in the latter part of the 18th century. Canaletto, Venetian artist in the late 1700s, became known for his cityscape views of Venice, romantic Venice. These paintings sold widely, ended up in the salons of the idle rich in Europe. And in 1846, the railroad arrives. Top right, sad moment in a way for Venice. Uh, and you, you see this bridge and the train across the bridge in the opening shot of summertime, if you partake of the entire movie. So the railroad opens Venice to a new period of crass commercialism brings tourist. We see in the mid late 18th century a tourist revival in Venice which sparks a revival in the economy. Industry at this time, what industry remains in Venice, some of it is still dotted on the islands around uh, Venice proper but most of the industry migrates to the mainland contributing to the drawdown of the water table uh, on the mainland and Venice itself becomes a commodity selling the myth and image of itself, its own past, becomes kind of a living museum. Today, 20 to 30 million visitors a year go to Venice. And it seems like all of them at one time or another, like Catherine Hebburn, end up in the piazza. The photograph there is from uh, the 1880s. The piazza, there's St. Mark's in the background, the bottom part of the Campanile, and on the right-hand side is the entrance to Florian's Cafe, where you can uh, buy some overpriced coffee. Napoleon, uh, even in the time of Napoleon, the piazza was referred to by him as the finest drawing room of Europe. Everyone goes there to see things and to be seen. And the Venetians, uh, very clever with their interest in profit-making enterprise, revive their ancient ties to commerce become, again, a city of merchants. On the left is some fabulous Murano glass, building on that centuries-old tradition on the island of Murano, as well as any number of luxury goods. You may recall the scene as Catherine Hebron is walking through the streets of Venice, uh, all the uh, overpriced shops 
selling all manner of luxury goods. What you won't see, or didn't see this year at least, in Venice was Carnival. That raucous period of celebration before the start of Lent. For the first time ever, the Carnival events in Venice were canceled due to the coronavirus. But, as I said, the gates of the city are slowly opening up to tourists uh, as of just last week, I believe. And so Venice, like a lot of hot tourist destinations or previously hot tourist destinations, has a complex relationship with tourists. They love to have them come to their cities, bring their disposable income to support the local economy, but especially those of you who have been to Venice could perhaps agree with the sympathies of the Venetians who say, enough is enough. We need to find a way to curtail, whether it's through banning of cruise ships was attempted unsuccessfully, or reducing in some other way the flow of tourists in Venice, not today, but certainly in the months and years ahead when tourism revives in full strength in Venice. Um, at this point, I'm going to stop and see if we have any questions from our audience. No questions? Thank you all for coming here on our trip to Venice, and I want to give you just a teaser. I've already mentioned we're going to be talking about and looking at canals again uh, next week. In this case, the Panama Canal. This historic postcard describes it as the world's greatest engineering feat. We'll be looking at the canal. It's a little over 100 years old, still in very good shape for someone of that age. And uh, for 400 years, Europeans and others tried to find a shortcut across the Isthmus of Panama. The Americans finally made it happen with a bit of technical know-how, some gumption, and what we now call gunboat diplomacy. The U.S. was able to force a canal through the Isthmus, opened in 1914, and still going strong. We'll take a look at its history, its present, and its future as well as we look at the Big Dig, Panama Canal, next Wednesday, 10.30. Hope to see you then. Thank you.